And welcome back to Square Off. Four years ago, Arizona cracked down on opioid abuse. One of the targets, doctors believed to be writing prescriptions for too many pills. But there was an unintended consequence. People who suffer chronic pain said, said they could not get the medication they needed. That's about to change. A bill signed into law by Governor Doug Ducey creates a carve-out for patients with chronic pain. Joining us to explain why the bill was needed and who it can help is Will Humble, Executive Director of the Arizona Public Health Association, former Arizona Public Health Director, and one of the champions of this bill. Welcome back to Square Off. Morning, Brad. The legislation was sponsored by Senator Nancy Barto. Why was it needed? Well, it, it, I'll tell you how it started. Uh, she was just walking her district like a lot of legislators do, and she would run into one person after the next that would say, I gotta tell you about my daughter or my mom who really is in intractable pain and can't get the drugs that they need to, for the pain relief. And if you look, do a root cause analysis, it goes back to the 2018 law, which, for, which had a limit on how much you could prescribe of opioids. Of, it's called 90 MME. Um, but it, but, but it, if, you, if a doc was gonna prescribe more than 90, they needed to do a consultation with another doctor. Um, on a pain management doc, and that had a real chilling effect on people being able to get relief. And also a chilling effect on other prescriptions that weren't necessarily opioids. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, well, I think one of, you talk about fentanyl, right? Well, f fentanyl, but just other prescriptions. I, I it seems like in 2019, 2020, there was a real chill on doctors oh. prescribing. Right. There's a, just a because of the 2018 law. There is a general chilling effect within the physician community to say, uh, to to really to overreact to what that law was intended to do, and 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 you do see it reflected. We do have fewer deaths from uh, the prescribed opioids after the 2018 law, but we see fentanyl skyrocketing. And I think a lot of that, or a portion of it at least, is people who are unable to get prescribed opioids seeking relief from street fentanyl, which is resulting in deaths. So how will chronic pain patients benefit from this law? Yeah, so this is a really good law. It's well-crafted, puts in good guardrails to provide people relief, but without opening the gates too far. So there needs to be a strong physician-patient relationship that's established before um, you can prescribe over the 90 MME limit. There's, uh, uh, there's a bunch of guardrails in there to make sure that, it, that it's working properly. Uh, there's a clear definition of what kind of pain qualifies. Uh, and, uh, it, and by the way, this, the new law reflects the new CDC guidance. The old CDC guidance from 2018, when the law was put together, had that 90 MME cap, and now uh, CDC has removed that, and this new law reflects that change at CDC. So it's interesting because I, I can recall doing stories back in 2019, pain patients who formed their own group, they held rallies at the Capitol saying, we need some help here, and here we are three years later, and it's happening. Is that the way it should work? Well, that they have to wait three years? Well, no, they shouldn't have to wait three years, but, it, but this bill shows, I think, the way public policy should work. Maybe not as fast as it should, but we had a big problem in 2018. The law was passed. It used best practices. Now, four years later, we're able to look at the data, see what's actually happening, and this is, reflects, this is kind of bill, looks at the unintended consequences of that 2018 law and makes some adjustments. And that's what public, that's what public policy should do, is like, we did this, how is it working? If it's not working in certain areas, let's change it. And that's what this law does. And let's go back to the impact of that 2018 bill. Uh, numbers show it, it did have an effect, correct? Right. So we see a lowering of deaths from prescribed opioids, but we see a skyrocketing, skyrocketing number of, of deaths from fentanyl. And, and that's a combination of a couple. It's a street drug for the most part. A lot of that is recreational use, and it's such a powerful drug that there's like no room for error on dosing. Um, but part of it is chronic intractable pain patients who can't get prescriptions for opioids looking for relief on the street. And so that's creating a feedback loop on the fentanyl side and those deaths occurring. And so we're hopeful that this will change prescribing practices among physicians, make them more confident that they can prescribe safely to their patients, and these high-need patients with intractable pain can get some relief that they're not getting right now. So I, th I think the fentanyl number of deaths uh, due to fentanyl is about five to six times higher than the rate 
of opioid yeah, deaths. It's, it's an exponential growth curve. Is fentanyl immune from any kind of public health it's a lot like this? Yeah, well, what, this bill is going to help. I mean, it, because we're, it's going to provide a safety valve for people that really need the pain so they don't have to seek the fentanyl on the street. Uh, but it's a, this is a big problem because it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's not, you just can't change prescribing practices to get to the fentanyl problem because it's a street drug. So Senator Marsh's bill from a couple of years ago, which made the test strips more widely available. Christine right Marsh thing. of Christine Phoenix. Marsh. Yeah. Um, the, the uh, naloxone drugs that are more widely available need to get distributed more effectively, but it's a big problem and not a single solution to it. All right. Will Humble, thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure.